So good afternoon to everyone. My name is Selena Tan. I am a program associate at the NAE Casey Foundation, uh, part of the Juvenile Justice Strategy Group, and it is my pleasure to open the session and welcome you to our event on JDI Connect. Um, if you're here, we're very glad to have you. We're recording this, so be sure to share it with other colleagues who weren't able to join once you tell them what a fantastic time you had with us today. So first of all, thank you so much for taking our poll. Um, we posted these on JDI Connect as just a fun way to get everyone engaged and start getting some conversations going about data. Um, it looks like some great things are going on with data in the JDI network in that majority of the time or can't have a meeting without data. Is, data is happening in our committee meetings, in your committee meetings, and that's a great thing. We're really excited about that. But we also know that we could do better. Um, there are shared pet peeves of data presentations. We should have put an option for all of the above because that's what some people seem to say. Um, and so part of what we're hoping to do today and beyond is really how can we use data more? How can we become better at really being data-driven um, detention reform? And how can we really help grow our community of data champions? So that's what we're hoping to do today. We're going to do my job here is to do welcome and introductions of our, the rest of our panelists. You're going to hear about an overview and highlights of the JDI at 25 report, um, an example of what's going on in Indiana and how you can dive deeper using data. Um, and we'll also have some time for discussion and Q&A at the end. As Beth mentioned, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat box along the way. If you hover over the Zoom information, you should see a chat box come up. So please go ahead and enter questions along the way as you have them. Hopefully everyone has seen the JDI at 25 report. It's available on JDI Connect if you haven't, um, and be sure to check that out. So we, before I get started with introductions, I wanna also give a huge thank you to Metis Associates and Impact Solutions who have partnered with us both in developing the report and also a huge role in developing today's session. You're going to hear from our associates in both of those organizations later on, um, but I really wanted to make sure we spend some time just acknowledging and thanking them for what they've done already so far. So quick introductions. Um, I've already introduced myself. You're going to hear next from Tom Woods, who is a senior associate with the Juvenile Justice Strategy Group at the NE Casey Foundation, and familiar to most of you. Um, you're also going to hear from Jason Melke, who is a chief data dude at Impact Solutions. Um, he's been working in JDI for more than 10 years and currently focusing on Indiana. A lot of you may have attended his awesome session at the JDI conference, and we're glad to have him here presenting again. And let me introduce Anna Minsky, who is a senior research associate at Metis Associates. She has also had more than 10 years of JDI technical assistance across sites. So we have great panelists who have many decades of experience in JDI data um, who have heard and worked alongside you. And I am thrilled now to turn it over to Tom Woods. All right, thank you. Um, and, uh, and thanks also to our colleagues at, uh, at PJI for providing the infrastructure and the tools and kind of setting all this up for us. Um, I am a, uh, a, a webinar newbie. This is the first time I have, uh, have, have done this kind of thing. So, um, I don't, I don't know how many of you are new to being in the audience on this sort of thing. This is certainly my first time being, uh, being on camera. So, um, so fingers and toes crossed uh, all, all, all across the board. Um, so I, I hope and trust that a lot of you, if not all of you, have had a chance to, uh, to read the report that we put together, uh, kind of celebrating, I guess, the, uh, the, the, the 25th year of JDAI and celebrating in the way that we customarily celebrate, not as Ken Mayo would put it by just saying rah, 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 um, but by using some uh, objective information to try and assess how far we've really, how far we've really come and how much of a challenge we still have, uh, we still have lying ahead. Um, I think every year over the last few years, we've tried to, um, you know, kind of provide a little bit more, um, a little bit more perspective, um, a little bit sort of a, a you know, kind of a, a different, um, a different look at, uh, at you know kind of what we can learn from the annual results reports um, and for the 25th year really for the first time we were able to put information together from sites looking across multiple years we were able to do trend analysis uh, really for the first time 
Um, and I think that sort of taught us some new lessons, shed, you know, provided some new insights for us. And I think that's not only interesting in and of itself, but to us, it kind of, uh, it gave us some new inspiration um, to think harder about what we want the, uh, the data infrastructure for JDI, JDAI to be uh, going forward and how we're gonna get there. Um, so first of all, uh, of all of the multiple findings that were in the report that we could lift up, uh, there are just a couple that I wanted to, to, uh, uh, to address in this sort of limited time, limited time that we have. Um, and some of this is not new news. I mean, we've known for a while that JDAI sites have gotten very good at uh, reducing their use of detention. Uh, the vast majority of sites are able to do that. Um, a kind of hidden story in there that's been persistent but cannot be repeated often enough um, is basically that as much as we've made progress in reducing our reliance on detention, uh, the, the racial and ethnic disparities that contribute to overuse of detention are still endemic. Through, uh, through throughout the throughout the juvenile justice system as a whole, and JDAI sites are certainly no exception. Um, and then I guess uh, some new insights that we were that we were able to get from taking more of a trend look across sites, at least over the last few years, um, I think kind of confirmed our intuition um, that there are some JDAI sites that are you know year after year after year they're continuing to make further progress and deepen their uh, their their detention reform efforts, and some sites. You know, kind of lose energy after after a time. Maybe they hit sort of a sort of a lull, um, and some sites are even starting to lose uh, ground that they uh, that that they had made up in the past. Um, so there really is a need for renewed momentum in some sites, and the data that we have uh, is starting to give us some leads to be able to identify where the need for that uh, renewed momentum lies. So to take the first piece of that first, um, decreasing rates of incarceration, rah rah rah, uh, but uh, increasing disparities along the way. And that's not only a sort of a regrettable, uh, you know, sort of miss in terms of a, of a target and aspiration that we've had that we've not yet achieved, um, but it also, I think, kind of reframes, should force us to rethink uh, what the challenge is lying, lying ahead of us. Because as long as those disparities remain, let alone when we see them increasing, um, that says more and more that when we look at what's the next installment, like what's the next phase of JDAI, how do we, how do we start driving our reliance on detention even lower than it's ever been? Um, that next phase has to include tackling racial and ethnic disparities because the, the, uh, the, the victims of those disparities really increasingly are, you know, those are the, the, that's the population that's left, um, the, the kids who have not yet been reached by JDAI are increasingly in those, uh, those, those disadvantaged communities. So what, is, what does that look like? Um, first of all, and I think this is not the first year that we've been able to, to put this statistic together, but one of the things that we found, uh, that we have found very useful for looking at uh, JDAI data across sites is to try and adjust for the size of the youth population in each site. So to take the numbers that you give us through the annual results reports, contrast those with data about the size of the youth population in your jurisdiction or in the, in the jurisdictions you serve. Some sites serve multiple jurisdictions um, and translate that into a, into a rate. Um, so right here, we're looking at the rate of annual detention admissions per 100,000 youth in JDAI site populations. And we define youth as age 10 to 17. Uh, for this for this purpose, that's kind of drawing on a practice that uh, that the federal uh, Department of Justice has used for a long time in terms of identifying the the population that's at risk um, of of involvement in the juvenile justice system. So you can see uh, across sites who all started at different times. So baseline years are different from one place to another, but wherever those sites started. Um, contrasting that to today, they have reduced the. Uh, They've, they've reduced their reliance on detention by approximately half. So across JDAI, the rate of detention admissions per 100,000 youth was almost 2,000 back when they started, and it's now just over 1,000. Um, that obviously represents significant progress, but if we start to unpack that a little bit, it's been uneven. So now we take that same statistic, annual detention admissions per 100,000 youth, and we break it up to look at youth of color and white youth, who are basically everyone else. So we determine who the who the that that the white youth population is really defined as the total minus 
the youth of color population from the information that you give us. So we can see the white population, or, or rate of uh, detention admissions, I should say, um, reduced by more than half, whereas the youth of color population is reduced by less than half. And in percentage terms, it's pretty close. But you can see, even though there's been progress across the board, and really, you know, in absolute terms, the biggest reductions have been among the population of youth of color. Yet, those disparities are still, are, are, are still very sizable. Um, in fact, they've actually gotten slightly larger. So in the baseline year, youth of color were about 2.6 times more likely than white youth to be admitted to detention. Whereas in 2016, despite or notwithstanding all of the overall progress that's been made, they were actually, that, that disparity had widened. They were actually about three times more likely to be admitted to detention. Now that's just looking at the detention admissions indicator. We have other indicators as well, um, and they tell much the same story. If we look at the rate of detention average daily population, um, that again has dropped by more for white youth and for youth of color. And if we look at the rate of commitments or the number of annual commitments um, per 100,000 youth in the population, and that's fallen dramatically. Um, but it has fallen even more dramatically for white youth than, uh, than for youth of color. And again, as a result, those disparities have, have widened. And to me, I kind of look at this, um, this way of sort of visualizing how those disparities have increased, and it really jumps out at me that, um, you know, basically there, if, if, we're, if we're trying to figure out where we need to make more focused efforts, to get our detention population down, to get the, the uh, to get our, our reliance on commitment down, um, increasingly that's going to have to focus on communities of color, and whatever the barriers are that have stood in the way or uh, you know kind of mitigated the impact of detention reform on those communities up to this point, whatever those barriers are, it becomes increasingly important that we that we find ways to get at those. Um, and whatever, whatever has been holding us back, has it been that those barriers are so intractable? Has it been that it's been too politically difficult or too resource intensive? Or has it just seemed too risky to, to, uh, to go there? Whatever has been holding us back, that, that is, uh, you know, those, 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 are bit, those are barriers that we need to overcome uh, kind of within ourselves and within our, and within our collaboratives. So that's sort of the next frontier of, of JDAI, the next frontier of detention reform, pretty much no matter how you slice it. Um, so the second big piece, and I think this really kind of builds directly off of that, is the need for renewed momentum in some sites. So how did we figure out that that's the case? Um, first of all, we came up with this idea of looking at sites not just based on where they are, but what's their trajectory. So there's sort of two, two aspects of that. One is the impact. How far have you come in reducing your use of detention since you started JDAI? And the second piece of it is momentum. Um, regardless of how far you've come since that, you know, kind of the start of your JDA experience, are you headed in the right direction now? Um, and adding those two dimensions to, and to, to the analysis, to our analysis of what's going on in JDAI, um, I think, you know, sort of provides some new insights, but it really um, sort of takes what seems like a pretty simple picture and complicates it significantly. Um, so first of all, just to kind of illustrate what I mean, when we talk about impact, you know, there were, these are just sort of hypothetical, kind of two, two sample sites. Site one is the green line, and site two is the red line. So on this measure, which in this case is average daily population, site one is really, they've had some ups and downs, but overall they haven't really reduced their reliance. They haven't really reduced their ADP since they started JDAI. That we would define as being low impact, whereas site two has, you know, made substantial reduction. So we consider that to be high impact. What about momentum? Momentum says basically site two, you know, things have kind of slowed down a little bit, but they've been continuing to make progress over the course of their time in JDAI. Whereas site one has really been headed in the wrong direction over the last few years. Their numbers have started to come back up after some initial reductions. So that would be a, a you know sort of a continuing downward momentum for site two and a sort of a reversal or, or a, a slowing of momentum um, for site one. So 
we start with the overall kind of big picture of JDAI. And as I said, this is kind of the first report, the first analysis that we've done looking across all of the results reports where we've been able to kind of stage, uh, you know, kind of look across, set up the data so that we could look at, at trends over time. Um, and in this case, we're just looking at the change in average daily population for these sites since they started JDAI. Um, the cohort of sites that we included in this is very sort of broadly inclusive. It represents about two thirds of the, uh, the total ADP across JDAI sites as of 2016. And probably more importantly, we're looking at sites for which we had at least five years worth of data every year, 2012 through 2016. Um, and this, co this sort of uh, large group of sites represents about 80% of all the sites that were active as of 2012. So it's really kind of a, it's not every single site, but it's a very good, broad, inclusive group. And across that group, although they started at different times, as of 2012, they had collectively made a really sizable reduction in their ADP. And it looks like things have been pretty static since then the the you know kind of it, at the at sort of at the aggregate level it doesn't look like very much has been happening over the last few years um but if we start to unpack that a little bit we can see that um first of all if we you know in kind of defining high impact sites as being sites that have reduced their adp by more than 30 percent in total since they started um they have actually significantly overshot that target but the sites that have fallen below that that have, that have not reduced by that much are missing that target by a lot. And actually in the aggregate, it seems like they're kind of heading in the, in the wrong direction. So just by adding that, that element of impact, we can start to see that what looked like a very simple and not very interesting uh, trend actually is at least two much more interesting and much more illuminating trends. And within the group of high impact sites, if we break those up into not just how far they've come, but how they've been, you know, kind of are they heading in the right direction now? Even some of those high-performing sites um, are not, you know, they're they're kind of hold, barely holding on or even losing a little bit of ground lately. Where there are other sites that have just been chugging along, they're kind of you know continuing to reduce their ADP every single year. What about the lower impact sites? Again, there's a difference in that group. Some of them, you know, really got off to a very slow start in JDAI, but they're now heading in the right direction. Um, whereas some of those sites that have a lower impact now, they used to be much higher performing sites. They, they used to have made, at one point in the past, they had made significant reductions in ADP and had been giving back some of those gains. Um, so when we put those things together, we can see there's actually four very distinct trajectories that we're, that we're looking at. And if I'm in one of the sites that's on, say, this low impact, low momentum track, then I would look at this and say, gosh, there's, there's sites on, you know, on all these other different trajectories who I ought to be learning from. I mean, maybe I should be talking with these sites who are the highest performing sites now, but once upon a time, you know, five years ago, they looked an awful lot like me. <laughs> um, how is it that I've ended up heading in this direction while they've continued to continue to make progress? Um, and for some of those sites that have, uh, you know, kind of gotten a, you know, made a big sort of initial splash with JDAI, they reduced a lot up through 2012. But in the last few years, things have kind of stalled out. They don't just have to look for inspiration or ideas to some of these other sites that have been around for longer and have been continuing to drive their numbers down. They could look at sites that wouldn't appear at first glance to have accomplished as much with JDAI, but they're starting to make they're starting to make progress now. So to me, the real sort of takeaway here is that there are so many opportunities for JDAI sites to learn from each other. Um, you know, this is a network of sites. It's a learning network. It's a network of people who have expertise and knowledge and experience um, that's incredibly valuable. And I think that's something that we all feel, um, you know, sort of in our gut <laughs> and in our heart when we're at the JDAI conference. Um, and I think sort of a, a, a challenge that we have not figured out how to, how to tackle um, is how to take that dynamic and take that uh, sort of those opportunities for learning and make them live outside of the conference hall, make them sort of live outside of that, that you know, sort of once a year or once every couple of years uh, get together. Um, I would also take from this analysis that data can be a really powerful point of entry to, to doing that kind of uh, cross-site 
collaboration. It gives you a, a way to, you know, not just look at your site, but to benchmark yourself against other sites whose experiences might be, might be of use to you. And at the same time, it can help you to figure out what lessons you might have uh, to, teach, to teach other sites. Um, all of that is possible. If your structure to make that possible, um, have that initiative in place. Um, in future webinars, we're going to explore that topic and we're going to talk about how we want to evolve and what we need to, how we want to evolve JDAI's data, data architecture, create the architecture we want to support the kind of cross site collaboration we want to see. Um, and we're looking forward to kind of uh, digging, delving into that and, uh, you know, kind of co creating with you a vision of what that, uh, of what that ought to look like. But in the meantime, I think we can start to enrich our thinking um, about what that could look like, what could it look like, what are the opportunities that exist in a place where there's a data infrastructure that allows sites to do that kind of shared learning. Um, and that's sort of the transition to, uh, to, uh, to Jason, who's gonna talk with us about Indiana's experience with JDAI. Um, Indiana has been rolling out JDAI site to site in a phased uh, kind of gradual manner and have done that with a shared data architecture as a fundamental building block. And when I say a shared data architecture, I'm not just talking about technology, I'm talking about uh, you know, kind of the, the, the learning support and the communication support um, to take that technology and really make it powerful and kind of bring it, bring it to bear on, on real world problems of, uh, of JDAI sites. Um, and Jason was kind of around at the, I, I guess he can tell you more, but I, I think he was kind of around at the inception of all that, was kind of an author uh, of, of all that work. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him now so that we can all start to uh, kind of uh, sort of learn, learn from his experience uh, in Indiana of what it looks like and feels like uh, to operate and to, co to kind of create that sort of shared, you know, data-driven shared learning environment. So Jason. Cool. Thanks, Tom. So I have several things. I'm going to have to jump around here. Uh, let's see. Share screen should have. Okay, it's not showing showing my screen for some reason. It says I'm still viewing Tom's screen. Can everyone see mine? No. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, stop sharing on my end and see if that uh, clears things up yep. for, for you. Okay. Now can people see my screen? Still nothing. No. Do you want me to advance for you, Jason? Uh, sure. Although, be I don't have, uh... So you it's, just tell me, because I have a slide I think that we ended up taking out. I apologize. Here we go. I got it. Oh, there you go. Okay. I'm not sure what's happening there. All right. So sorry for the technical issues. Um, so for the, for the Indiana folks, um, you may not recognize me. I don't have my hat on. I, I shaved my beard off. Um, the, the Indiana folks, if you saw me at the conference or you, you saw me on the agenda, you saw it said Chief Data Dude. And that's something that the Indiana folks coined, gave me that name in part because I like my hats and, and I usually have quite a beard. Don't have that today. So um, it is me um, that's here. So what I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to talk about several things. Um, if you know me, you know, I like to talk. I'm a good listener, but I also like to talk about this stuff. I really love this stuff. I think it's really fun. Um, just a little bit about my background before I jump in. I have a background in IT. So I used to develop systems. I did that for about 10 years, but then I switched and got my master's in social work. And that's really what brought me to JDAI. I was looking for something that was going to help me mold those two together. And when I got into this work, um, and I'm really grateful to all the folks in, in Indiana who I work with, um, it's a great team um, from the top down and all the way to all the counties that I work with. We have a fantastic team. And so since I get about 15 minutes here to, to chat, um, I want to talk about the things that I feel like, or what, what were the things I feel like have really made a difference for us in Indiana with this focus on data. And um, so I'm going to start with, if my screen will move, there it goes. We're going to start with the lead partner agencies in Indiana because I think this is really the reason that we're so successful, quite honestly. 
is we have um, incredible leaders in Indiana as it relates to JDAI. Um, these are all our lead partner agencies, the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute, Indiana Department of Correction, Indiana Supreme Court, Indiana Department of Child Services, and the uh, State Division of Mental Health and Addiction as well. And then we also have the Indiana Department of Education who will be coming on board um, soon as well. And what's interesting about this, the way we have this set up, you know, two of our Supreme Court justices used to be juvenile judges, you know, which is really great for Indiana and they're incredible leaders for us. And this work is state-led, locally driven. It's a judicial, judicially led effort. And that presents some really interesting opportunities and challenges for us. And I'm gonna talk about some of those um, as I jump in here. So here's the way it looks on the state map. We have 31 counties uh, participating in JDAI uh, across the state. And that represents 69% of our youth, age 10 to 17, which is over 500,000 kids currently. And we, this has been a phased approach. So there's our initial cohort was eight counties. Then we had another 11 counties after that. And then finally, we just brought on 12 more counties. Um, so this is a, a continually uh, evolving uh, initiative here in, here in the state of Indiana. So what I wanna do is talk about, I'm gonna kind of show you what these, the next 15 minutes will be comprised of, um, see how much of this I can actually get through. So using data, what does it mean in JDAI? The, the, the emphasis here is, and one of the things that when I started as an intern many, many years ago is, what does that really mean? You know, as a core strategy of JDAI, what does it mean to use data? And that always, was, that always has been a question that's kind of sat with me. And so I wrestled with that and I wanted to try to make it less scary. You know, how can we make data more accessible to people? Because really, if you're, we're talking about mastering this, this use of data, that's a cultural thing. You know, that's not just having one data person in your system who knows data really well. It's like, how can we all embrace data? So I wanna tease that out a little bit. The next one is how we use data work groups in Indiana. I think that's been um, very powerful and I think it'll continue to be powerful. I think that's still evolving and I'll get into that. Um, being proactive with data quality. I feel like we've really emphasized from the beginning that this piece around data quality and we're really seeing a lot of benefits from that. Um, for example, one of the things we were able to do this year is we asked for our 2016 um, reports for, for all of our counties, for all the 31 counties, and we were able to get those for all 31. They were all able to um, do a quality, quality review, data quality review of their data in advance, and they submitted those and got those to us within two or three months after the year ended. So by first quarter of 2017, we had 31 reports, um, which was a, a great achievement for our team. Um, we worked very hard on that across the state. Uh, next, I want to talk about the burden versus value of data visualization. And this is something I talk about a lot of this piece of burden versus value just in general with data. You know, data can have a lot of burden, but it also has incredible value. So how can we increase value and reduce burden? And that's kind of the barometer that I often operate under. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit as well. So using data. So what, one of the things I like to do is I start with this slide. This is, we, we do data workgroup kickoffs. And when I first start with a, a brand new site here in Indiana, I'm like, you know what, Let, let's just be real. Let's just talk about you, you were asked to come to this two hour data work group kickoff. How did you feel when you were asked to come to this, potentially voluntold to come to this meeting? And just to kind of ease the mood, you know, it's like how can we come into this in a way that we can connect right from the beginning? I, I always point out the guy in the back left corner because a lot of people miss out on him. So just kind of notice his reaction, it's just utter disappointment. And that seems to be the one a lot of people resonate with when they first start this. It's like, why do I have to be in this data work group kickoff? And particularly, why does it have to be two hours long? You know, so anyway, I like to start there. It's really good to kind of bring some humor to this work. Data can be too serious sometimes. The other thing data is not. So let's start with that. If we're gonna talk about what is data, let's talk about what data is not first. Data is not this, it can be this. But when we're talking about using data and JDAI, this is not what we're talking about. So if you're one of those people, if you were terrible at math in high school or you just couldn't stand math, that's okay. You actually might be a really gifted person when it comes to using data and JDAI. It's not quite the same thing. So understand, it's not geometry, it's not trigonometry, it's none of that stuff. You can push that aside, brush it off, um, and feel good about that. The other thing is, and I often see this too, is particularly in local government, you know, you'll have this relationship with the state or you'll have this relationship with uh, foundations or whoever, you know, funders where you, they're being, you're being asked for reports, you're being asked for data. And this has been going on, who knows, maybe a decade or two at this point where you've been um, consistently sharing data. That tends to be what people, a lot of people think of, think of using data as this, 
of is, oh yeah, you know, we, we do use data. We compile these reports and we send them off to whoever asked for that report and we never see it again. And we don't really know how it's being used, you know, and we also can't necessarily vouch for the data quality. We just needed to get it done. That, that's, that's one of those things we want to defeat. We want to defeat that that's, that's not at all what using data in JDAI is about either. So what is it really? I, try, I always really focus again on it's how, let's reduce burden, let's increase value. So one of the ways you do that is by simplifying this message of what does it mean to use data. So first of all, you see this trend chart and Tom showed some really great trend, trend charts earlier and it's something we talk about in Indiana a lot is, is we're emerging and we have enough data to start trending and the value of that. So let's just say, you know, this is an example chart that we see here and you can see it spikes about, you know, a quarter of the way through the chart. So you're gonna have some questions about that. Say, like, what, what, what happened, you know, or what actually has helped us decrease significantly since that spike? There's a lot of different potential questions just in that chart. And then from that, you have deeper digging. I'm sure everyone in JDAI has heard this term a ton at this point of this deeper digging. And if you haven't messed that, that term up and set it totally backwards sometime, you haven't said it enough. Um, because that happens too. So then you have some insights from that. You know, you've, you've done some deeper digging. You now have some additional data. That's really important. We're not talking anecdotal stories here. Those are important too. But that you've been able to dig up some data that helps to inform you, some evidence that has given you kind of this light bulb moment. And then finally, this is a way that we really harness our initial core strategy of JDAI, which is collaboration. Is how can you all take action together on this data? You know, how, how can this inform policy? How can this inform practice? And there's a lot of other things we could say about the use of data, you know, in terms of doing some studies on the side or some validation with uh, local university folks or something like that. But this is what we're really talking about to do well with JDAI. If you can do well with this, then you're going to be doing very well in JDAI. All right, so let's move forward. So one of the things that I've, I've started doing just in some of the conversations I've had around the state is there, there does also tend to be a fear about, I don't, you know, as a judge, your, your job is to judge. You're, you, you know, that's what your job is as a juvenile justice system is to judge. And so, you know, part of the challenge is if you're going to embrace data is how can you not feel like, oh, you know, the robots are all going to start making my decisions for me and then where, what's going to happen with my discretion? It's really important to understand that being data driven is powerful. It's, it's, it's a tool that you have in your back pocket that you can pull out and you can use to inform your decision making. And that's what using data and JDAI is really about. It doesn't replace your discretion. And that's an important point to make. So let's talk next about sustainability. So this is a, we've, again, locally driven, uh, state-led initiative. So what does that really mean for us in Indiana? And, and I think there's parallels in terms of this is a foundation initiative, but it's locally driven at the site level. So, you know, there's some parallels there. And so I want to get into some of the sustainability a little bit. This, this is a quote from Judy Cox, who I've never actually met Judy Cox, but I quote her all the time, and I'm sure she hears her, you know, something says, someone's saying my name, someone's saying my name, because I talk about Judy Cox a lot in terms of this particular quote, which I totally stole from the Pathways. Um, but use of data became part and parcel of everything we do. We would not think of doing a program or developing a policy without it. She nailed it. That's exactly what we're talking about. And so that's, that's a really good barometer. And maybe that's something I wish you to hang up on their wall and frame it. You know, that, that's really what we're aiming for. And so from that is there's this piece of if you're going to be using data to inform practice and policy at a local level, and Indiana, let me just use the example of Indiana, we're state-led, locally driven. That means at a local level, they need to be empowered by data. You know, that, that's really what it's about. And so how do you do that? How do you, how do you coach up sites? How do you help give them the tools and um, that they need to be able to use data well? And so the light bulb moment for us in this work in Indiana was to focus on the data work groups. And the data work groups are really key because the reality is, is our local government systems are underfunded or and under resourced typically, you know, is what you often see. So how can we approach this from a strengths-based perspective and think about, you know, are, are there skills that are here that we could develop? you know, that are with whoever exists in these systems right now. You don't have to necessarily go hire a, a full-time data analyst or even a part-time data analyst for that matter. Of course, that's always beneficial if you have the ability to do that. But not all our sites do, in particular in Indiana, where we have a lot of rural counties with small budgets. How can we help to develop skills for them? And that's where we really started talking about the data work group. So the function of the data work group in Indiana, first and foremost, is to ensure strong data quality. And that's number one for a reason. And I'm going to get into that in a bit more. Master the fundamentals, dig deeper, 
and data storytelling. That's the function of the data work groups in Indiana. And I would say that we've done great with the, the top two bullets. We're in the third and fourth bullet right now. That's what we're starting to focus on. And in fact, we just offered to across the state, to all of our JDI sites, we offered a data visualization, data storytelling training. And we reached out to a national expert to do a, a two-day training for everyone that, from all of our sites. You know, not everyone in all our sites, but at least one or two people from each of our sites. And that was a big hit. Um, so this is one of the examples, one of the ways we support from a state's perspective to support this initiative. So a technique that if you don't all know about it, and I was asked about this at the conference because I didn't quite get to it, is sustained silent reading. This is a best practice um, in, in using data. And essentially all that's saying is when you have your meeting, that your steering committee meeting or your uh, whatever meeting that is, you know, some, some work group, start with data. You're going to bring that data, you're going to share it, but what you're not going to do is send it out in advance and say, hey, everybody, take a look at this report. We're going to discuss this at our meeting. Because what inevitably happens, and, and we've all been in this position, you might not have had time to read it, or you forgot to read it. And then what happens, you're in a meeting where you're not informed by what you were supposed to be um, you know, discussing. And so what that means is you have some potentially some very important voices being left out of that conversation. You might make some policy decisions, and that person's quiet, not wanting to admit that they didn't read what they were supposed to read. So what you do is you take the first 10 minutes of your meeting, everyone reviews it silently. And then you discuss as a group. Everyone starts from the same place. Great technique. It's something we've done in the data work groups, and, and we reinforce that over and over. Um, and even some of our steering committees have embraced that technique. Data quality, I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, and I know I'm, I'm already running out of time. This happens. Um, so data quality is a critical, critical piece. And, and it's exactly what I've been alluding to. But I, I want to use one. I, I could use multiple reasons as to why data quality is so important. But the one that I always go back to is if this work is really about using data to take action on data, that's really what it's about. You want to make sure of two things. First of all, that the, that the data that's informing you is accurate because you don't want to have faulty data and then you make a decision that was misled by that data. That's one thing. The other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to get caught in a meeting where someone questions the quality of your data and you don't have a response. If you can't say what you've done to ensure that that data is accurate, you, you might lose some people and potentially some very important people. And then once that happens, it's very difficult to get them back. So to be proactive about how you address data quality is, is a very important. And there are some techniques for being able to do that that I think is a subsequent webinar down the road sometime. Don't have time for it today. Um, you, so you do develop trust with members of your collaborative. If you can say, hey, our data, our data work group, we know our data is right because here's what we do. That's gonna squash it. You can move on to the conversation. You can move on to the discussion. Um, the other thing you can do, excuse me, one of the other things you can do with data quality is you can leverage data tools to catch errors. A lot of our sites have canned uh, systems, you know, they have a vendor that they um, pay to use their system and they might not be able to change much in that system in terms of what's captured or how it's captured. You can use tools on the back end as long as you can actually access the raw data to look at that, look through the lens of data quality. Um, and those are some things that we can show again, I think, in a, in a future webinar. Mastering the fundamentals, this is something I'm really into. I'm a big Cubs fan, um, and this, this book, The Cubs Way, just came out. And one of the things that really stood out to me was the, the Cubs were real big on analytics, um, real, real big on analytics. And one of the things they said that really made a difference for them was the relentless pursuit of fundamentals. And, that's, and I, I, I often have said, even before this came out, that you know, I use the metaphor of don't take your eye off the ball. You know, no matter how many years you've been doing this work, don't take your eye off the ball. Make sure you're doing that really well. So here are, here are our questions, and we've adopted these a little bit. We've adapted them from what we found on the JDI help desk a few years ago. So number one is, of those detained, who are they and why they come to the door? How long are they staying? Who's taking up the most beds on a daily basis? Are youth who allegedly committed low-level offenses being detained? And consistent with your stated purpose of detention, are the right youth being detained? And I could go into why we adjusted these a little bit, um, but I think, again, that's another conversation in the future. Um, but this is, these are our fun fundamentals, and we've created worksheets where during sustained silent reading, sites are looking at the QRS report or whatever data they have available to them, and they're responding to these questions to inform what's the story they want to tell to their steering committee and to their other work groups. So visualizing data, that's what I want to get to lastly, and I have just a couple minutes here. Um, but this is some really cool stuff, so I want to make sure I take a moment to show you this. 
So for many of you, you'll recognize this. This is the QRS report, which I'm going to just say I'm really grateful for because I operated for years without anything like this. And it was very difficult to think about the different ways you want to visualize this data. What are the important questions and the different, you know, the different lenses that you want to look through. And by the way, I should say with the fundamentals, Rego is absolutely a part of every time we look at that, those questions, we look through the lens of Rego. Race, ethnicity, geography, gender, and offense. And we look through that. And so this gives us a lot of that right here. So what you're looking at is from the QRS report, this is the de detention risk screening um, outcomes. You know, how was the detention risk screening tool used in relationship to the decisions that were made? And so, you know, from this, if you were to look at this, if you're not used to this report, it's going to take you a while to really figure out what's, what do we want to highlight from this? You know, what's important? So what I've done and, and what we've done in Indiana is we have this. And so what I'm, I'm going to jump in and just show you some examples. We, we've embraced a tool called Tableau uh, through Impact Solutions. It's not something that the state's necessarily endorsing. Um, some sites have decided to go down that road as well. Um, there's a lot of competitors for Tableau and um, this business intelligence is really what this is. So what we've done is trying to figure out, again, burden versus value. How can we reduce burden of of, of understanding what the data is telling us and increase the value of what it's telling us. And in this example, this is something that we look at comparing two years of data, but you could trend this out over multiple years as well. Um, and so for this particular site, which is unnamed, I don't even know actually if this is accurate data, um, you have admissions and for 2016 and 2015, you have a length of stay and you can hover, you can hover over these. And before I get too far, I just wanna say, this was built from an Excel spreadsheet. So your ability to do something really cool like this, if you just have a data set that you can pull into Excel and then you connect it to a tool like Tableau, you can do some really cool things very, very quickly. And that's one of the reasons that, that uh, we've embraced it at Impact Solutions. So you'll notice it also shows the, the, the trend between those, those two years. Um, and again, you can kind of hover over those to, to get some additional information. Um, and really big reduction between 2016, 2015. And then there's a percent change as well over here. And I think that, there we go. Um, you can see the percent change as well as length of stay. And what's interesting is it mirrors what we learned from the end results um, during the conference is admissions have decreased dramatically. The length of stay has increased and that's what happened here. But what's really cool about this is not just your ability to hover and to see some really cool things, but also up here, and I'm gonna move this over again, select Rego. So we, build, we try to build Rego into all of our, our visualizations. So you might want to look at this through the lens of gender. I just click gender and it changes it up. And so I'm able to see through that lens um, this, this same data. And I'm going to look at race and ethnicity. Now clearly this doesn't give you all the answers you need, but this is a really great way to see some things very simply, um, very easily, um, and to have some additional questions. Things really stand out to you. You can see the use of color. You, know, you can see that in terms of the percent change when it's been an increase um, versus a decrease. So let me go to a, another one that I wanna show you because I'm a little over my time. This is a risk assessment heat map. So when I showed you that QRS report previously and how difficult it was to figure out what is this really telling me? Like, what should I be noticing? In this one, you, you, there's a lot to notice um, and, and you can notice it much more quickly. So down the left-hand side is the actual decision that was made where they released, released with conditions or detained. And across the top, you see the numbers. That's the actual score. What was the score uh, on the risk assessment, um, the detention risk screening tool? And so what we've done is in, in, in red, we've boxed in what, does the tool, what are the tool recommendations? What's the range? And so you can see released. Um, and you can see that those tend to really hover right around that red box. You know, they, you did have one. You had one, a couple outliers, 59 that didn't have a score. And then you had one that scored eight. And so, you know, in general, it looks like the kids that are scoring for release are being released. And then you have released with conditions. And, you know, one of the things you're going to notice is look at the color. So up here, you can see the color is much more pronounced. The tone means there's, there's more. There's more referrals that make up that particular score and that decision. You don't see as dramatic of color down in release with conditions, which immediately tells you you didn't have a whole lot that were using the, the risk, detention risk screening tool that were released with conditions. That's one thing. The other thing you notice when you look at detained is this is spread out all over the place. And you did have some that fell within that range, but you had a whole lot that fell outside of that box. 
and that were overrides um, into secure detention. And you know, the question you might start to ask from that is, you know, what's this mean about our use of alternatives at intake? You know, when we're when we're using our detention or screening tool. Um, so this opens up a ho whole lot more conversations much more quickly by by utilizing heat maps. That's what this is, um, and you're using your color to really draw attention. Um, and your ability to hover over things is really nice. And I want to show an example of that on the next slide is this is a dashboard. And so it's taking the same thing we were just looking at here. And now what I want to do is I want to interact with the map. And I want to say, okay, I want to really know these kids right here that fell just below the threshold of detain and were overridden. If I click that, it changes the map. You all see that, how it changes the map? And that's all the referrals. Where 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 where'd those kids live? That's what this particular address is about. But you could use other um, low, you know, geography uh, data points to do this. Um, but you could do that all throughout. You could really do some investigation you know, of kids that were detained at, at low with, with no score. You know, so this, this is where it gets really fun, is your ability to visualize this. And again, if you had a tool like a Tableau tool and you had a, a spreadsheet, that you could pull into Excel, this can connect directly to it and do this kind of visualization. And it's something in Indiana that our county, several of our counties have decided to go this route. And with some training on data visualization, they're producing dashboards and they haven't hired data analysts to do this for them. And they're doing some really cool things and they're sharing it you know, with other sites, they're sharing it with the state so we all can learn from that. So I'm gonna end with that, I believe. Let me go back to my presentation because I, I believe I'm past my point. Yes, I am. So that's all I have to say with that. I, I rushed through that pretty quickly, but I hope that was of some value and I look forward to, to being a part of these discussions going forward and learning from how everyone else is doing this as well. Okay, I think Anna is next. Hi, all right. Thanks so much, Jason. That, um, it's really inspiring to see um, the work that you and so many different sites are doing. Um, you know, taking the sort of infrastructure of data and the fundamental questions of who's being detained, for what reasons and for how long, and, and just um, going so much deeper, which is the point of this webinar. So um, uh, for the last few minutes, we really just wanted to open up the chat box. I know a couple of people have, have used it, so it's definitely working. Um, and no matter what your role is in JDI, we wanted to take some time to reflect on how what we've talked about today relates to what you're doing tomorrow, next week, and you know, in the months to come. So um, you know, we, we've heard a lot about challenges. So Tom talked about the challenge of keeping up momentum in detention population reductions and ensuring that those reductions are distributed equitably across um, all youth in, a, in the jurisdiction. Jason talked about some of the challenges of making data use institutionalized, making it part and parcel of everything that we do. Um, and, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, many of the people on the webinar today and many and many other JDI sites and, and I find that the challenges that, that sites and the people who work in sites face are more the same than they are different. Um, you know, now with JDI Connect, we have like kind of a cool new way to learn from one another and as Tom was talking about, sort of bring the, the conversation, the esprit de corps, uh, beyond the conference, um, but it's that's so important that we wanted to actually make time for it on the call. So, um, uh, and it also, I was thinking, it really ties in with Jason's idea of being sort of strength-based and, um, and, and having a, a data work group and working together. So if, if we could start thinking about like coming together and working together, I was hoping that the uh, folks who are on the webinar could use the chat box to share um, a data challenge, mundane or complex, that, that you're going to confront when you go in to work tomorrow, um, and and sort of get a conversation started about, um, you know, are we facing similar challenges? Can we work together? Uh, you can either send it to just the presenters or to the whole group, and I'll read some of them out loud. Um, also, you know, as Selena said, um, you know, we can take uh, questions for the presenters at any time, um, and maybe while people are thinking about um, what their challenge is that they want to lift up, um, we could go to one of those. I have um, a question for Jason. Um, how many youth are in prison in Indiana, do you know? Uh, not off the top of my head, I can't pull that number, but we do, that is, it's on the uh, end results report, so we do have, we do have that number. 
And, and for those kinds of questions, maybe, you know, we can follow up afterwards or in, in JDI Connect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, we'll do one more presenter question. This is sort of, um, you know, for Jason or for Tom, you know, I find that, that sometimes uh, when you're presenting someone with data and they don't want to hear it, uh, you know, they're, they're just very, um, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's the data quality or maybe they're talking about the data quality. Um, but there's, for some reason, they don't want to hear what you have to say. Um, and, you know, juvenile detention data can be very emotional. Do you find in your experience that it helps more um, to sort of address the, the reasons that the audience is resistant to the information or sort of a the dispassionate presentation of, of data and focusing on data fundamentals is a, is a better way to break down barriers? It's a great question. Um, so, you know, this is, this is something that, that we're dealing with in Indiana as well. And I, I think that's something that we're, um, uh, we, we talk about a lot and, and I, I, I think there's a lot I could offer here, but I think one of them is think about the way the data is being presented too. if, you know, question is the data set up in a way, is it, are we telling the story in a way that's really simple? Is it possible that people are being quiet because they don't really understand what it's telling them? You know, that's, that'd be one thing that I would suggest is like, are there ways you might be able to simplify? The other thing is, is I think it's across the private sector and the public sector. It doesn't really matter if you're going to be data driven. It really requires buy-in by leadership. I, I think that that's critically important and it makes this work very hard if, if leaders aren't um, embracing data. And so that, that's what I think I would offer um, initially on that question. Yeah, I, I would agree. The thing that I would add um, is I guess in, in, in my experience, um, it's, it tends to be more productive to focus, uh, you know, when, when uh, people either are disbelieving or kind of aversive, they just don't want to, you know, sort of deal with the implications um, of, of, you know, sort of a, a, a very strong finding from the data. Um, I think that focusing less on what are the sources of resistance, focusing less on why people would be, uh, you know, kind of dragging their feet about it and focus more on why it matters, focus more on why this is important. Um, because I think that tends to end up being the thing that overcomes the resistance anyway. It's very hard to get people, it's very hard to change somebody's mind, but I think if you can give them a reason to change their own mind, um, you know, very often they, they, they will, uh, they'll, you know, sort of uh, follow, follow the evidence and get there. Um, if you can kind of remind them and sort of reinforce to them how valuable it is to, uh, you know, once they've actually done that. Thanks. Um, I'm going to lift up one challenge that somebody shared and then Selena is telling me that there's a question that I can't see. So uh, maybe I'll turn it over to her to read that. Um, the challenge was, as the person that audits data and prepares the reports, it's challenging for me to find errors and determine when I need to go back and try to rerun them to submit. I know that the types of errors, um, typically very small percentage in the big picture are expe expected, but how do we reconcile that while still making good use of our time? And that's, that's a really great data challenge that I think goes to the heart of what Jason was saying about value versus burden and how do you make those really like important challenges every day. Selena, did you want to read a, a question? Yeah, there's a different question. Um, I think it's more for, J for Jason um, from Jesse Owen that's asking, is the dashboard utilized through data, team meetings, or sent to stakeholders for self-review? Yeah, so in Indiana, we, we use them um, in several different ways. So one of the ways we're set up in Indiana is, you know, we have Impact Solutions is a consultant in, in this work, and we work with the state team, and we provide um, uh, consultation to them by coaching them up on how to use dashboards like that so that they can coach up the sites on how they can then use them. So that's one way that we do it is we work with the strategist, um, the state strategist, to work with the, with the sites. Um, we also use dashboards at the state steering committee meetings, and we present at the state steering committee meetings utilizing um, these kind of dashboards and then at local levels as well. Uh, we do have local sites who use these in Tableau. You can use what's called Tableau Reader, which is a free tool. As long as you have someone who's developing the views for you, you can consume and look at and interact with views for free. So that's been a nice um, 
a situation for us to be in for our counties. It doesn't have any additional cost for them to look at the things that we're producing. And then in some situations, like I said, even the counties are starting to um, produce dashboards and visualizations themselves as well. Um, so I see it starting to penetrate more. And, and that's really, a, I'm glad that was brought up because this is really about uh, impacting culture, you know, and, and how, how, does, how well does the culture embrace data? And it can't just be top down or only a consultant doing the work. You know, it's, it's how well has that been embraced by the, by the entire culture? And then the last thing that I wanted to do before I turn it over to Selena to sign off is to sort of bring the conversation into JDI Connect. So um, if you can see my screen. Um, the other question that I um, might have asked if we'd had more time is, you know, coming off of sort of the, the visualizations that Tom and Jason shared, um, what's an example of a juvenile detention related indicator that you've been tracking over time and how has it changed and to what do you attribute the change? And, you know, I, I hope that even if people are shy to sort of talk on the webinar that we can start to have this conversation in JDI Connect. So, um, yeah, I, I think we should go ahead and take that other I and mean, I think there isn't a, a sort of a quick answer to that question about handling uh, data errors kind of you know sort of recurring data errors and not allowing those to kind of suck up all of your all of the all of the oxygen in the room um, and I think that's a, a incredibly important uh, topic but a longer topic than we have time for so I'd suggest that we add that to the discussion board uh, too and I'll, I'll, I'll commit to, to, uh, to posting at least my take on that uh, you know as soon as possible yeah yeah me me as well uh, Selena Great. Uh, do you mind switching back to the slides for a second? Uh, let me do that. Um, okay. So I also wanted to point out that someone, I think Nancy has um, responded to the question about Indiana. Do this. Um, here we go. Uh, so Nancy responded, and let me read her response. That Indiana had 336 commitments to the Department of Correction in 2016. So thank you, Nancy, for the information. Appreciate it. All right. So really quickly, I'm going to close this out. Um, as Tom and Jason and Anna have all shared, there's a lot of information, a lot more questions that we want to get into. This barely scratches the surface um, of just the, the world in which we want to start to get together in and dive deeper in. So here's some thoughts I had. You know, do you want to share a new visualization tool or ask advice from others? Jason shared about Tableau. Um, would love to hear other people's experiences using Tableau or other visuals that they found useful. There are many out there and we want to make sure to share that knowledge. You know, do you have other ideas for ways we can drive detention reform? Do you want to know what other sites are doing? Do you want to see more events like this or have ideas for what topics we should do next? Um, do you want to access other resources that we have available? These are all things that we're trying to build together. As Jason mentioned, it's about changing the culture, right? Not just having one lone voice in the wind crying for data and, and, and championing for, for using data, how do we genuinely push everybody in our sites and our network to be hungry for data, to understand data, be committed to data, and really be excited about data, not that terrified look um, from survivors. So we want to hear from you, get connected in our conversations. Um, there's a big world out there of, of everyone who's on this call and beyond, and we want to know who wants to be part of this conversation. So help us by getting on JDI Connect, joining the conversation that Anna is starting. You know, follow Tom, follow Jason, follow Anna, myself, um, keep up to date on what's going on and help us to generate this content. We're really looking to everyone in the network to help us figure out as we continue to move forward in this, what the best way we can do that is um, to best serve the needs of the site and of our kids. So thanks everyone for joining us today.
again, this will be recorded and posted, and we hope that you found it useful and we'll share it. So thanks.